Devlet TV ekranlarına hoş geldiniz. Bugün bir özel konukla ve özel yayınla karşınızdayız. Türkiye'nin, İngiltere'nin Türkiye Büyükelçisi, Birleşik Krallığı'nın Türkiye Büyükelçisi Sir Dominic Chilcott bizimle birlikte olacak. Ve İngilizce olarak ben devam edeceğim. Sir welcome, hoş geldiniz. Hoş bulduk. It's, a, it's lovely, it's a very big pleasure, big honor to welcome you in our studios. So in a snowy day in Istanbul, yeah. everything yeah. everything is fine. You had a meeting uh, and you, you could come easily, no traffic and all snow. Actually, I think uh, there was very little traffic on the streets. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the city under the snow looks very pretty. Uh, no, it's a nice time to be here. But you like you like Istanbul. You've been to Istanbul. You told me before the program. Yeah, I came to Istanbul as a student uh, yeah. in 1984. 84? Yeah, I came Great. here and, um, and I, I was learning Turkish. And um, then I uh, spent three months um, based in Istanbul, but going to some other parts of Turkey too. And then I began my job, my first job as a very junior diplomat mm -hmm. in our embassy in Ankara in January 85. Okay. So I did three and a bit years in Turkey in the 80s. And uh, I always wanted to come back. And eventually, <laughs> 30 something years later, okay. I succeeded and, uh, and I came back and started work as the ambassador here uh, four years ago. Four years ago. Mm -hmm. So welcome again. Thank you. And maybe we'll have the chance to hear some of your Turkish uh, during the program, maybe, till the end. Okay. Nasıl istersen. Okay. So we have a surprise for you. Not a surprise. Uh, I, I told, told you about this, but uh, you're, you are also a YouTube presenter. You mm -hmm. talked about your mission, you, your journey in Turkey. Let's watch it and then uh, let's oh go. Right. Okay, that is a surprise, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank Hello everyone. Just over four years ago, on the 16th of January 2018, to be precise, I presented my credentials to His Excellency President Erdogan and formally began my service as the British Ambassador to Turkey. Here are a few reflections on this anniversary. I originally came to Ankara in the 1980s as a junior diplomat on my first posting. I always knew I wanted to come back because Turkey is such a fascinating country with wonderful people and terrific hospitality. It took me 30 years, but I did it. What's changed since then? The scale of development, roads, airports, bridges, hospitals and the like is deeply impressive. I've noticed more colour and energy in modern Turkey than the Turkey of the 1980s. There's lots of noise and debate facilitated, of course, by social media and a multiplicity of TV channels. And Turkish society is right at the forefront of our technological age. The British-Turkish relationship was pretty good in the 1980s. It's even better, even stronger now. And following Brexit, Turkey and the UK are the two big European countries not in the European Union. We are geographically at opposite ends of the European continent. Both of us hugely value our connections to the EU and European bodies like the Council of Europe, while at the same time busily engaged in other regions of the world. One constant of the last 40 years is the importance of our strong defence partnership as NATO allies. What have been the highlights of the last four years President Erdogan's visit to the UK in May 2018, the record number of British tourists visiting Turkey, around 2.6 million in total in 2019, our bilateral trade shooting past the $20 billion target, Turkey's support for the UK hosting COP26 at Glasgow, followed by Turkey ratifying the Paris Treaty, the exchange of scientific information about the coronavirus since the early days of the pandemic, and Turkey's supply of personal protective equipment for British health workers. I could go on in this vein. There's a long list of good things. But maybe the most important success was our new free trade agreement, which we signed on the 29th of December 2020. On a personal note, my wife and I have really enjoyed travelling around the country, from Gaziantep to Gelibolu, from Antalya to Sinop, from Alachata to Elazığ, and to so many more places. And when our spirits need a lift, there's always the incomparably exciting and wonderful Istanbul. I'm not leaving anytime soon, inshallah. There will be many more good things to celebrate in Turkey-British relations, and I'll make more visits to beautiful and historic parts of Turkey in the coming months. And as it's that time of year, let me wish everyone a very happy 
healthy and successful 2022. Thank you. Sir, uh, it's a professional. Congratulations. Well, I think it's the first time I've seen that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we need a presenter here <laughs> at Cherry TV. Maybe we can well, work together sometime. So yeah. welcome again uh, well, thank to you. that magnificent Istanbul with a snowy day. So let's start it. Uh, yeah. our, our main subject is mm. environment, of course. But few words, British-Turkey relations. Mm. Uh, where are we now, sir? Yeah. Well, I think we have very warm um, and um, strong relations between the two administrations. Mm. Uh, I think uh, the fact that we left the European Union has made us feel that we have quite a lot in common, mm. just because we're both in the same European region at different yeah. ends, but we're not inside the European Union. And it gives us an incentive, I think, to do more together. Mm. Uh, I think our trade is very important. Uh, it took a knock back in sort of 2020, 21, because of um, the restrictions imposed mm. by the by the pandemic and also partly as a result of the adjustment from leaving the European Union. Yeah. But the fundamentals are very strong, so I'm sure it will it'll grow strongly as we go forward. Um, I think as two NATO allies, we do a lot together. We have very strong military to military relations, very good relations between our secretaries of defense. Um, that's all good. And uh, Turkey matters to us for lots of um, reasons where we have to cooperate because of the region Turkey's in, you are the kind of the last really stable democratic country before you get into, um, you know, the poor, the poor Syrians in the disorder of their mm -hmm. long civil war, or indeed, you know, the, the problems that we see in other countries in the region, Iran, Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, or wherever. And um, some of the threats that emanate from that instability, like irregular migration, serious organized crime, uh, counter-terrorism, counter-narcotics, these sort of things. Uh, it uh, makes a lot of sense for us to work very closely with the Turkish government and agencies dealing with the same problems. Um, and um, I think, you know, we both, both our countries benefit from being able to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a pretty good picture, uh, you know, generally across the waterfront of government to government business. I think I'd like to see um, more people to people connections, yeah. more cultural connections, more um, uh, connections through education, mm -hmm. but I appreciate that education in the UK is pretty expensive for lots of people, so that, <laughs> you know, um, that must be a factor. But uh, nonetheless, if you look at um, flights between uh, Turkey and the United Kingdom, there do seem to be more and more of them these days, uh, in normal circumstances, yeah. obviously. And uh, that's a sign, I think, of the interest that uh, Turkish people have in the UK and vice versa. And so that's very welcome. Nice. So politics, economy, uh, social relations, strategic relations, but we have environment nowadays. Yeah. Top of the agenda of the world. So you have hosted a very a crucial meeting in Glasgow. Yeah. Um, so how did everything go? What, what were the key points discussed in the summit yeah. in general? Well, um, the aim, if you think back, the aim, the aim. in the run-up to Glasgow mm. was the big aim, the big headline, was to try and keep alive the Paris Treaty target mm. of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, that was a very ambitious thing to try and do. And if you look at all the commitments that were made in Glasgow and you add them up, um, you don't get to 1.5 degrees, but you get a lot closer mm -hmm. than beforehand. And if everybody makes further efforts, as they promised to do, then I think we can say that we kept the 1.5 degree target alive, although it does require further work. Mm -hmm. Second thing, uh, we wanted to uh, raise money for the poorer countries to help them both with the you know, the decarbonization challenge they face, but also to um, help them make themselves more resilient against the existing threats from climate change. Now, the uh, target that we had wanted to hit was $100 billion per year for these purposes. We didn't get there, but before the Glasgow meeting, we knew it was out of reach. But um, we have put ourselves on a course to achieve that target by 2023, so we will get there, mm. and then indeed to go beyond it. So I think on money, we've done quite well. Okay. Uh, we've um, basically, in the run-up to, to Glasgow, 
we got more and more major economies to pledge that they would become net zero economies by a certain date. And um, two years before Glasgow, about 30% of global GDP mm -hmm. belonged to countries that had made these net zero um, commitments. At Glasgow, that number was 90%. So 90% of the global economy now belongs to countries that have made a commitment, a public commitment, um, that they will become net zero by about the middle of this uh, millennium. Mm -hmm. In the UK's case, it's 2050. In Turkey's case, 2053. Yeah. Um, and that's very important. Also very important is that everybody agreed at Glasgow that they would revive their 2030 target for emissions reductions mm -hmm. and be more ambitious. So, for example, we have announced in the UK what our new target is for 2030. Uh, it's going to be 68% reductions of greenhouse gas emissions compared to 1990 levels. Mm -hmm. So two-thirds of the journey to get to net zero, we are, you know, we've said we will achieve by the end of this decade, which is pretty remarkable. And we hope other countries will also make um, similarly uh, ambitious uh, pledges. Uh, then there were various other things that, w that we did at Glasgow. The, um, one of the aims at Glasgow was to create a sense of we're all in this together. You know, we're, we're, we're, we only have one planet. We all live on the planet. Mm -hmm. We have to solve this together. So we need rules for being able to uh, not just make commitments, but measure those commitments exactly. and be seen by other countries as to whether we are keeping our word. So we had to have a common rule book. We, we achieved the common rule book. At Glasgow, it sounds a bit technical, but actually really, really important. And I think we generated, because Glasgow, in the end, the uh, Glasgow Climate Pact was agreed by consensus of all, I ought to know this number, 197 parties to the UNFCCC, whatever the number is, yeah, nearly 200, oh, 200 nearly 200 parties. They all agreed it. And that, that also, I think, was a, an achievement in itself. Uh, there were some sexual, some big sexual statements made about vehicles, about phasing out hydrocarbons, in particular coal for electricity generation, um, about uh, reforestation, um, about support for developing countries with the climate threats that they face now. Yeah. Uh, lots of other good stuff as well. And uh, not everybody could sign up to every one of those individual sectors, but a lot of countries uh, did sign up to things. So I think if you take the whole, whole all, what everything at Glasgow achieved and the road to Glasgow achieved, it's pretty significant, but, and this is quite a big but, these were commitments. Yeah. The, the, you know, the task now is to translate those commitments this into action. This is my action. question. Yeah. There are some statements about, you know, the commitments, yeah. the promises, yeah. uh, but there's a difference between the commitments and the concrete steps. Yeah, you? exactly. Do you, uh, you know, participate? Do you agree with this, or you are optimist in general well <laughs> with the <laughs> results? Uh, um, Am I an optimist? I don't know quite how I would uh, how I'd answer that question truthfully. I think mm. I want to be realistic about it. I think yes. we all want to be realistic. Okay. Uh, I think um, we. I mean, every country that's that was at Glasgow, every country that made these commitments, I'm sure, made those commitments with serious intent. Yeah. Um, the issue is whether we can actually find the political momentum as well as the technological and financial support necessary to deliver the commitments. And um, I think for all of us it's a very, very, it's a very big challenge. But uh, it's not the job of any one country to go around the world telling the others, you know, you said you would do X, now you must do X. Mm -hmm. I, but I think collectively we will meet regularly enough as the international community at least once a year and we will review how we're doing and it will become clear quite quickly now that we have the common way of measuring our progress whether we are collectively doing enough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, for developed countries like the United Kingdom, we have a degree of historic responsibility. You know, we, I mean, you know, the Industrial Revolution began in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. you know, and it was powered by coal, the yeah. dirtiest fuel you can have. Everything gets started there. So, <laughs> so you know, we, we bear responsibility for that, but we're conscious of it. And because we bear responsibility for that, and because we're a big G7 economy, um, we have made maybe the most ambitious pledges right. to reduce... Uh, carbon emissions uh, in the United Kingdom and some of the most generous pledges in providing finance to help other countries. So I think, you know, we will do our part. 
we have a government that is uh, very committed to it, that has passed a law enshrining the 2050 net zero target in law, mm -hmm. which means the government can be taken to court if it pursues policies now which are not consistent with reaching net zero by 2050, mm -hmm. the citizens of the UK can take the UK government to court for breaking the law, for not doing enough. And I think that kind of public pressure on the government, okay. can, you know, let's see what happens. But I mean, it, you know, it could be quite, it could be an important reminder to the government that it, you know, it, it has to keep up uh, progress. Uh, the presidency of UK is mm. going on nowadays, yeah. and uh, you will uh, let it uh, to um, Egypt, I think, the, the next That's right, yes. Egypt. Yeah. So, um, what are the UK key aims in, in that, um, for the next year, for yeah. those periods of presidency? Well, rather um, than Glasgow, or together with yeah. Glasgow's decisions and all. Well, of course, we feel a degree of what you might call diplomatic ownership mm -hmm. of <laughs> what was agreed at Glasgow. Yeah. I mean, the way the, the way the international community works on climate, as you know, it's all by consensus. Mm -hmm. So you can't actually make any particular country, you know, do something. We, all have, we, we are all sovereign countries and we all follow our own policies. But as the uh, president of the COP and as the hosts of Glasgow, we are very interested um, for those reasons and also for the wider, obviously the wider environmental reasons, in um, encouraging countries mm -hmm. to keep to the commitments that they've made. So this is a year where we have to do what we promised, which is revise our 2030 target and show how we're going to get there. And we will be talking diplomatically to lots of other countries around the world, saying, how are you getting on with your 2030 target? Is it ready yet? I mean, interestingly, here in Turkey, that you're building, you're writing your 23 target and 2030 plan, sorry, 2030 target mm -hmm. and 2030 plan at the moment. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you're doing it with uh, the support of, of the uh, UNDP in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we wish you all, all well in doing that. And we'll be doing this around the world, encouraging people, you know, let's keep up the momentum, of, let's keep up the Glasgow spirit that went into that agreement by consensus. But, um, you know, you don't actually have any powers as the presidency to s enforce this. Yeah, so how is the system? You, you, you know, you write emails or there are some... Uh, different meetings or any control system? Uh, how do you uh, well? How do you work? So the UN as F the president. The, well, as the presidency, um, uh, we have a president, Alok Sharma, Alok Sharma who chaired yeah. chaired the meeting. He's in charge of all of this. And he will continue. Involved. He will continue his visits, and he will talk to people directly, virtually, in person. I hope he'll come to Turkey in the first okay. six months of this year. Maybe here in this. Uh, maybe he can come to Chevrolet TV. Who okay. knows? <laughs> um, I mean, he, you know, he's very personally very committed to it, and yeah. uh, is a you know is a strong supporter of uh, of uh, climate action, and um, you know that's really the way we work. We work through kind of diplomatic and international engagement, mm. and then there are these regular meetings through the year: the G7 meetings, the G20 summits. You know, at the end of the year at Sharm El Sheikh the Egyptians will convene a meeting of all the countries. And so there'll be certain spots during the year where you can, we will have climate on the agenda and we'll be around the table with our G7 partners or our G20 partners or whoever it is. The European Union will be doing the same yeah. as the European Union. And we'll be looking around and saying, you know, are we all doing what we need to do? And, um, and that, that's, I mean, it'll be through that sort of diplomatic method that we will make advancements. You know, the, the subjects like global warming, Mm. Uh, the zero waste and carbon neutral mm. are top of the agenda of all of the meetings, all of the yeah. summits. Mm. Uh, and as a diplomat, you know, you are dealing with yeah. all of this with politics, economy, social matters. But now, uh, this is true, huh? The yeah. Always environment. You talk yeah. about environments. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the crucial one and the most important one. So, in uh, that context, how is the situation? Maybe uh, let's talk it mo uh, talk about mm. it more. Uh, how is UK working with Turkey on climate issues and the problems and all? Yeah. With the ministry, with the presidency and all? Well, in, um, before Glasgow, a long time before Glasgow, mm. um, Turkey had, um, had applied or had announced its candidacy to be the president of COP26, mm -hmm. as had the <coughs> UK and Italy. So right at the very beginning, we had a discussion with Turkey about how we might manage the fact we had competing bids. Mm -hmm. 
and it was agreed between us that um, this time Turkey would graciously stand down and let the Italy and the UK pursue a joint bid for, yeah. for COP26, which we did. So from the very beginning, we've been, and this is now three, three, at least three years ago, we've been talking to Turkey about uh, our wish to be the COP26 president and what we would try and do and what we might be able to do with Turkey um, in parallel to that. So we've had a lot of exchanges. Uh, I think specifically where, um, you know, we, there are things going on in Turkey that we can learn from mm -hmm. and which Turkey is very open with us about. I think your, um, you know, your zero waste um, program is absolutely excellent. Yeah. And the fact that it's led by the first lady, mm -hmm. Emine, Erdogan. Emine Erdogan, means it has tremendous kind of authority mm -hmm. and it's very well known about. So I think, you know, that's... There's a, the, the, what you've achieved from there, I think, is important. You've also you've had a lot of success in installing renewable electricity generation. I think you're the fifth or the sixth largest European yeah. Yeah. country in this respect. Lots of projects going on and new developments yeah. and yeah. Well, that's so I think the stuff that we can learn about what you're doing in, in yeah. Turkey, the reforestation program that you've mm -hmm. had. I said I was here in the 1980s. Ah, great. Well, when I was here in the 1980s, most of the Anatolian plain was a desert, well not a desert, but it, you know, you didn't yeah. see many trees. Yeah. Now you see trees everywhere. I mean, mm. I think it's been a real transformation mm. how you're, and a great success. So I think there are all those things that we can take inspiration from. And I think from our side, what we can offer Turkey, maybe the best thing we can offer Turkey, is support with access to private sector finance for uh, green projects in Turkey. And we have a number of ideas for doing this. We have something called the it's called something like the Climate Fund Accelerator Program. Mm -hmm. I, ne I never quite remember the proper name. Yeah, okay. But this is a global program where it applies to a, a, number, a small number of <coughs> countries around the world, but a number of countries, where um, we've identified projects in those countries with the host governments uh, that we think um, we could find investors to provide funding for, mm -hmm. and that's excellent. Uh, then this March, on March the 17th, in London, we're organising a... Green Investment Conference, a yep. British-Turkish Green Investment Conference, so just for Turkey. Okay. The idea is to bring together policy makers uh, from government and uh, local authorities um, to talk about how they tackle the issues they have of climate change, but also critically to encourage the City of London investors who are looking to invest in mm -hmm. green projects mm -hmm. uh, to come and see what you know, the Turkish government or Turkish cities are doing to see whether there are projects that would appeal to them. So um, I hope it'll be a way of matching the, f you know, the, the financial power of the City of London with the determination in Turkey to, um, to introduce a lot more green projects. And then the third area, I think, where we have already uh, begun to make a difference is our UK export finance is available for uh, green projects in Turkey, provided they have a minimum um, of uh, it's about 20-25% content sourced from the UK, the value of the project, which is for a, for a um, uh, um, sort of export finance program, it's, uh, it's quite a low threshold. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we're, we're, we would be delighted, this is quite a big pot of money, we'd be delighted to use this uh, UK export finance for more projects uh, in Turkey. Okay, great. Uh, so let's come to UK. Um, rather than or besides mm. COP26 yeah. presidency, uh, how is the UK approaching to environmental yeah. you know, program and issues? Well, I think uh, because we have this sense of you know our historical responsibility. Yep. Because we were the president of on host of COP26 mm -hmm. and co-president with the Italians, um, and because we think it's the right thing to do and we believe in the urgency of the problem, we have set ourselves very ambitious targets, and I've mentioned some of those already. Yeah. We don't see any contradiction between ambitious action to reduce emissions and economic growth. Yeah. In the UK, I think, that if, I'm, if my memory is right, compared to 1990, more or less, the UK economy has grown about 78, 80%, that sort of order, which is significant. Mm -hmm. At the same time, our emissions have fallen by 44%. So, you know, there is no contradiction. We are, I think, amongst the G7 countries, maybe our record of reduction of emissions at the same time as achieving high rates of growth uh, may be the, the best there is. But, I mean, you know, we can all do this. Um, so I think that's 
that's one area. There's a real conviction this needs to be done. And I've mentioned that um, you know, the targets we have for 2030 and, and 2050 are, are ambitious, and the fact we've enshrined the 2050 target in law is ambitious. We've also said that, uh, for example, on coal, uh, going back again, sort of about 1990 times, uh, I think something like in the order of 40% of electricity generated in the UK was generated from coal. That figure today is about 2%. Mm -hmm. And we've made a commitment <coughs> that by 2024, that figure will be zero. zero okay. So no more coal to produce electricity in two years' time. Which is, you know, considering where we were 30 years ago, is, uh, is pretty extraordinary. Mm -hmm. On vehicles, we have made a commitment that there will be no sales of new vehicles that use have traditional petrol or diesel engines mm -hmm. after 2030. 2030. 2030. So that's in what, eight years' time. In eight years' time, if you want to buy a new car in the UK, you will not be able to buy a petrol-driven car or a diesel-driven car. They'll all be whatever the new technology is, mm -hmm. hydrogen, batteries, whatever it's going electrical, to be, yeah. electrical. So that's pretty significant. Um, so I think we're challenging ourselves. Uh, I know what the government, the British government, believes that if the government sets very clear targets and shows political de determination to achieve them, if you have an innovative um, private sector, uh, you will motivate the private sector to deliver the products you need to achieve your goals. So I think they're pretty confident that we may not have all the technologies right now that will enable us to get to net zero by 2050. But if you tell industry, this is what we're going to do, folks, so you know, you get with the program, and actually industry itself wants to do this, <coughs> so it's not as though we're trying to persuade industry to do something it doesn't want to do. Most uh, industrialists also recognize the dangers from climate change, and they want to change. If you look at, for example, you know, one of our big, what, what would have been, maybe it still is, a big oil major, BP, mm -hmm. There, they, a few, a few years ago now, they said BP shouldn't in people's minds stand for British Petroleum. It should stand for Beyond Petroleum. Mm. So, and they are converting themselves from what was a hydrocarbons uh, organization into an energy company of the future, which is going to be more and more about renewables. And so I th this is not something that industry resists. I mean, there can be extra costs up front as you make these changes, but the benefits to our, you know, to our survivability as a species, you know, fundamentally, um, are obvious. But also, I think the benefits for uh, companies that are the first movers to embrace green technologies and green products, given there will be global demand for these things, it, uh, you know, the benefits are commercial benefits. They give you a head start. So there's a lot of interest um, across Europe, frankly, and in the United States and in China and lots of... We're all kind of competing to mm -hmm. who can produce the most efficient small car battery, you know, mm -hmm. who can produce a really good hydrogen fuel cell, um, you know, who can, who can produce the most efficient solar panels. Mm -hmm. You can see it's happening in the solar panel industry. You can see solar panels capturing more and more energy from the sun all the time as they get better and better and better and become cheaper to produce. And it's very exciting this is all happening. So um, you asked me earlier whether I was an optimist. <laughs> I, think, I think when you think of, what the, of the power of technology and what you can do, if you've, if, and it's, this is for governments. So governments, we, the government sets a very clear direction, a very ambitious <coughs> target, and then supports industry in making the changes uh, without getting in the way of industry. I think you know, we can do this. OK. Uh, for government, for the industry, yeah. uh, everything's OK. But what about the, the people, the, the, the common sense, the public opinion, the students? Yeah. Yeah. The young generations, yeah. uh, how they are looking to that, that kind of matters? Well, I think it's probably the true in most countries that the younger generation are even more enthusiastic mm. for climate action than the rest of their societies. And that's certainly the case in the UK. There's a huge support for this program in the younger generation. Um, for the I nature, for animals, for everything. Uh, well, I yeah. think it's... Um, uh, it is, yeah, I mean, it's generally for protecting the environment. Mm. And, mm. you know, the UK government's view, like I'm sure every, most governments' view, is that it's not just about emissions reductions, although maybe that's the most urgent and important thing we need to be doing right now. Mm. It's also about protecting biodiversity. It's also about, you know, clean air, clean water. Um, it's about using fertilizers 
in agriculture in ways that um, you know don't damage the ecosystems uh, or indeed run off lots of sort of pollution into the rivers all these things uh, and we all want a world which is you know cleaner and healthier for ourselves and we've you know we've lived through two years of a pandemic mm -hmm. which is a reminder of you know of the risks and the vulnerability that um, that we face so uh, no you're right this is uh, this is holistic mm -hmm. uh, and the approach should be holistic but we and I think you'll find um, in British society there's strong support for climate action I think we know we know you know things like electricity are likely to be a bit more expensive to start with although actually um, I'm told now that the uh, uh, offshore wind and indeed new nuclear but, um, particularly these we haven't spoken about these yet but the small modular nuclear reactors um, uh, if they come on stream as planned in the early 2030s mm. their unit cost of electricity is not going to be it's going to be comparable this you know so and these are going to be within people's reach so as the technology improves you know these pr the prices ought to come down and I think that means you know public support won't be undermined by facing you know sharply rising bills the awareness is um, uh, is high more than before maybe you can definitely say no definitely all over the world. yeah yeah yeah so and actually you know if you look at um, BB the BBC has, a, has had a role in this in mm -hmm. the UK mm -hmm. because we have a public sector broadcaster they have been broadcasting about climate change and the threat from climate change mm -hmm. for years and years and years we have a national meteorological office which contains some of the best uh, science about the weather mm -hmm. in the UK and they have been talking as well as giving us weather forecasts mm -hmm. they're also contributing to yeah. discussion about the role has changed uh, yeah, about weather yeah. about you know weather is okay but weather, weather events as yeah, we call them <laughs> and one of the you know one of the ways that we I mean people in different countries feel climate change in different ways so in I think Turkey is quite vulnerable to mm -hmm. climate change mm -hmm. I'm told your winters now are something like four degrees warmer than they mm -hmm. used to be. I mean, you know, this is quite serious stuff. And in the UK, the way we notice climate change, I think, it, first, is in changing patterns of rainfall. So we were used to fairly kind of steady rainy days, mm -hmm. particularly through the winter, which meant that the land was, you know, fertile and ready to go for the crops. And then, we, you know, we would think of having rather dry summers then when the crops, you know, it all kind of worked. Okay. But uh, nowadays, I think we're getting um, maybe the same amount of rain, but instead of it falling steadily over a longer period of time, we get more dry spells, and then we get rather intense rain, which is in some ways the wrong sort of rain, because you know it floods, it causes flooding, um, and uh, maybe it doesn't kind of sink into the soil in the same way. You know, so I think our, our agriculture is being challenged by climate change, but I think in Turkey's case, probably even more so. So you know the snow is also very important yeah. uh, and in those snowy days uh, in all over the Turkey. So let's say, let it snow, let it snow, <laughs> let it snow. And like Dean Martin, the official part of the program is over. Right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, finalize with uh, maybe some Turkish word about Turkey, because we saw with, with your family, with your wife. Mm. Uh, you've been around all over the Turkey, mm. you know the places, Alacatum, Mardin, and mm. uh, so you, you plan, uh, are you planning to go somewhere else in Turkey after, the, of course, the, the pandemic situation? So you had planımız var mı? So so öyle diyeyim. Evet. Um, şey, uh, tabii Sandım tabii. Artık sona eriyor. Evet, evet. Normalleşme başladı. Türkiye'yi de epey gezmişsiniz eşinizle birlikte. Evet. evet Nasıl buluyorsunuz? Yani. Hem de yeni planlar var mı? Daha evet, buradasınız çünkü. Evet. Yani tabii ki yani. Türkiye'de olmak büyük bir zevktir, büyük bir privilegedir. Çünkü yani Türkiye'de o kadar güzel şeyler var ki, yani uh, seyahat imkanlarım var. Tabii ki gidiyorum ve eşimle beraber. Nerelere gittiniz şimdiye kadar? Ho, oh, yani her tarafta. Hemen hemen her, her yer. Yani her yer. Evet, şey um, uh, tabii ki yani uh, plajı gidiyoruz. Tabii deniz Ama, sahil. Yani, yani deniz sahil. Aynı zamanda şey uh, tarih yerleri, tarih. Ki, yani Hitit yerleri, hmm. klasik yerleri, um, arkeolojik, arkeolojik yerler, Göbekli Tepe, Göbekli Tepe, Göbekli Tepe. Göbekli Tepe. Very famous. Uh, uh, Çatıl Hayuk, Çatıl hmm. Hayuk, o da çok önemli, çok um, yani arkeoloji açısından çok Tabii. önemli bir yer. Um, aynı zamanda uh, şey Kapadokya, çok hmm. seviyoruz Kapadokya da tabii ki çok güzel. Um, şey Sinop. Hmm. Uh, Yap, yaptığım ilk uh, ziyaret uh, Sinop hmm. idi. 
Orta, Turistik yani, mi? Turist, yani şey, şey iş, iş, i̇ş, iş ziyareti. Çünkü o zaman bir uh, Royal Navy gemisi, yani savaş ha. gemisi geldi. Evet, evet, I remember. Um, uh, ve um, uh, Sinop şey, uh, Vali ile uh, görüştüm. Uh, Vali Bey bana dedi ki, uh, Sinop Türkiye'nin en mutlu yeri. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Çok güzel. Çünkü yani, neden? Well, Hani şey neden neden de biraz karışık ve kompleks hmm. ama yani uh, Sinop uh, mübadele döneminde hmm. yani uh, şey Bulgaristan diye Balkan uh, ülkelerinden uh, gelen, gelenler gelenler vardı ve ve faydalandı. Evet. Ve belki biraz daha açık bir uh, ulusal ulusla arası bir um, şey görünüm olabilir hmm. orada. Ama, ama e, daha bir buçuk yıl, iki yıl mı var görev e, sonuna? Yani bu yıl büyük ihtimali son yılım son olacak yıl. ama yani bakalım göreceğiz. O zaman yeni ziyaretler, yeni evet. yolculuklar evet. olacak beraber. Aa, tabii ki, tabii ki. Biraz yani, da gastronomi. Kesinlikle. Gastronomi e, tabii şey e, iyi hatırlatınız çünkü <gülüyor> e, şey e, bu sene Antakya'da bir evet. gastronomi festivali tabii, var. Expo. Expo ve evet. tabii ki eee um, katılmak istiyorum. Botanik o evet, hemen bir şey. Hatay'da Hatay Hatay'daki gastronomi çok ünlü. Çok. Aynı zamanda Gaziantep gastronomi fena değil aynı zamanda. <gülüyor> evet. Um, ve hemen her yerde güzel ya yani yiyecek, içecek şeyler var. Her zaman, her zaman gibi. Thank you so much. Çok teşekkür ederiz. Bir bize. Bir çok daha yeniden ederim. buluşmak üzere. İnşallah. Evet, teşekkür ederiz. Evet, Sir Dominic Chilcott. E, İngiltere Büyükelçisi, e, Birleşik Krallık, Ankara Büyükelçisi, Türkiye Büyükelçisi bizimle birlikteydi. İzlediğiniz için teşekkür ediyoruz. Yeniden görüşmek üzere. Hoşçakalın.